These are often the first element of a costume that comes into the rehearsal room. Because shoes, you see, are important for character work. As an actor feels their way into a character, they need to find her gait, her posture, her way of moving through the world. Does she stride confidently in the highest heels imaginable? Or does she shake the ground with well-worn combat boots? Are her steps constrained by dainty little mules? Or can she run freely in sneakers? Shoes help build the character from the ground up. As I read Ephesians 6.15, as shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. I'm transported back to the rehearsal room at the Middlebury College Theater Department. Early in rehearsals, a shoe rack would appear to the left of the door. And rehearsal began with the ritual of removing whatever shoes I arrived in, usually heavy snow boots, and putting on the shoes of who I would become for the next few hours. At risk of sounding like Miranda Priestley from the seminal film The Devil Wears Prada, what we wear matters insofar as it impacts how we move through the world. Don't believe me? Try hiking in flip-flops. Or try braving the depths of Chicago winter without a coat. What we wear matters, not because of aesthetics or labels, but because of how it equips us for a particular task. This is true literally and metaphorically. Which brings us to the armor of God. Perhaps like me, you grew up with coloring pages and paper dolls that emphasized the importance of this spiritual garb. Or was that only me? <laughs> Maybe so. Take up the helmet and the sword and go forth the Christian soldier. I'll admit that this imagery, it never really resonated with me. It felt too far removed from my daily life. I'm actually surprised that no enterprising Sunday school teacher thought to translate the metaphor from imperial armor to football uniform. That would have been much more culturally resonant to a group of kids growing up in Auburn, Alabama, where everyone, whether you liked it or not, attended high school football on Friday and then watched college football on Saturday. The imagery fails to resonate with me for a different reason these days. It's not my lack of familiarity with military regalia, but rather a dissonance between my understanding of God and the images of war that are flooding the news. A dissonance between a metaphor of battle and a yearning for the battle to stop. The author of Ephesians uses this metaphor for a reason. It's one that's familiar to his audience. It was culturally familiar as it calls on the uniform of Roman soldiers, and it was scripturally familiar as it pulls from the words of the prophet Isaiah. 
Isaiah 59, which we heard read earlier in service, describes God donning armor as she prepares to give out justice for transgressions. The people have turned their back on righteousness and truth, and God is getting ready to do something about it. The armor of God was a powerful metaphor for the Christian community at the time. Ephesians is attributed to the Apostle Paul, but it was actually written by one of his disciples, his followers, a common practice at the time. And Ephesians is unique because unlike other Pauline letters, it was not written with one particular church community in mind. Ephesians is actually a more general letter written to a broad audience of fledgling Christians. Christians who at the time were figuring out how to do this new thing called being Christian. And so the author advises on multiple aspects of the Christian life, including how to face opposition. This is a metaphor for a people who had to equip themselves against opposition and even discrimination and persecution. It encouraged them to stand firm in their beliefs even when others questioned or disagreed. Yet, throughout Christian history, this language of spiritual warfare has translated often into literal warfare. A metaphor meant to encourage spiritual strength has justified the persecution, oppression, and death of those who believe or worship differently. I think it's a great sin of our religion that the very thing that should make Christians agents of peace, that's what the text says, put on the shoes to preach the gospel of peace, has far too often made us agents of violence. Which was never the author's intent. Look to verse 12. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. This passage was never about battling a particular person or people. This passage is about standing against the forces that turn hearts and minds to destruction. Forces that work through human dynamics and systems, forces of greed, of fear, of the desire for power and control, forces of hate, forces that are very much at work in the world around us. The language can maybe feel a bit much for a Sunday morning. But if I think about it, there is a present darkness, right? A present darkness that insists that there's not enough for everyone, that pits us against them, that attempts to calculate which precious child's life is worth preservation. Spiritual forces of evil that whisper of nihilism, and hopelessness. So we do, like our Christian ancestors, need to be strong in the Lord and strong in the strength of their power, not so that we can strike our perceived enemies, but so that we can withstand and organize against evil wherever it is found. We need spiritual and moral strength for a time of spiritual and moral crisis. So while the metaphor of armor 
maybe rings hollow. Let's actually look at what this armor is supposed to do. This armor asks us to seek and to speak the truth. To literally wear the truth as a belt around our waist so that we don't get tripped up. We're called to pay attention and to be informed. To be curious and to dig deeper, to do the things that maybe our middle school teachers taught us to do. Check your sources. (laughs) And to tell the truth even when it is unpopular or difficult. This armor girds us with righteousness, giving us eyes to see what is right and what is just. It's a breastplate. It asks us to hold righteousness close to our hearts at all times. This armor compels us to move our feet, whatever shoes you choose, to go through the world with a stance of peace. A peace that's proclaimed through our words and our actions. This armor offers faith as a source of protection. It's part of what I liked about this image on the bulletin cover. Of someone's arms wrapped around to protect a tiny sprout. It's trying to get roots and grow. Faith, it's a protector. It's a guardian of our hearts against those forces and powers of evil, against those forces of hopelessness and greed. This armor grants us salvation. The knowledge that, yes, we mess up. And that we're given forgiveness, not because we earned it, but just because we are. Because God loves us. A gift that then gives us the chance to try again and to extend that forgiveness to others. This armor equips us with the Holy Spirit so that we may know that we're not alone. There was a French pastor, and forgive my pronunciation, I never took French, (laughs) named André Trocmé. Maybe you've heard the name before. He ministered in a small village called Les Chambons sur Lignon. And he was a committed pacifist, an advocate of social action. Having learned from others at both the Sorbonne and Union Theological Seminary in New York City, before he ultimately settled in a remote village pastorate. In 1940, Nazi Germany invaded France and set up a puppet government. And this government began to pass laws that included a demand that Jewish refugees, political dissidents, anyone standing against that regime be handed over. And Trachme preached the following to his congregation as this unfolded. He said, tremendous pressure will be put on us to submit passively to a totalitarian ideology. The duty of Christians is to use the weapons of the Spirit to oppose the violence they will try to put on our consciences. We shall resist wherever our adversaries demand us obedience contrary to the gospel. We shall do so without fear, but also without pride and without hate. Trachme understood that spiritual strength is required in a time of spiritual crisis. That only the armor of God could equip his congregation for organizing against these forces of evil, against the way that, yes, 
They could violate through physical force, but also through the mind and the heart and the soul, deteriorating from within. The village of Les Chambon became a haven for refugees. Not a single person seeking sanctuary in that village was ever turned over to the authorities. The armor of God provides a way for us to stand firm even when the world feels so unsteady, to ground ourselves in the midst of large-scale catastrophe and the difficulties of just everyday life at work, at home, with friends. And this is hope. On the final Sunday of our hope series, I offer you this. Get up and get dressed. It's pretty good advice for daily life. <laughs> Do it literally and metaphorically and spiritually and theologically. Get up and get dressed. Put on these garments so that you might offer yourself and your community a vision of something holy and better and good and just. Put on these garments and work to make this vision true. And if it helps, maybe it isn't the armor of God. If that doesn't work for you, maybe it's the uniform of God or the capsule wardrobe of God. Maybe you envision it not as armor, but as the sun hat and the gloves you need to work in the garden or the coveralls you need for the workshop or the briefcase you need for the classroom. But my friends, have hope. And find the right shoes. For indeed, we are well equipped with the spiritual tools for the times in which we live. We are equipped to move through this world, looking not to do harm or wage war, but to proclaim the gospel of peace.